Welcome to this instructional video for pages 36 through 40 on the metabolism notes. Well, we're about to embark when we get back after Thanksgiving on a very important topic, the regulation of the metabolic pathways. And we can kind of break this up into four different types of regulation. The first type is going to be reciprocal regulation. And this is going to be important when you have opposing pathways and probably the best example of this is glycolysis versus gluconeogenesis and so what we know is that whatever metabolic state you're in maybe over here on the right maybe you're fasting maybe you're jo uh, enjoying a, a, an excellent uh, donut like these two people are in, enjoying this guy looks like he's in the world donut eating championship I want to party with this rock star here he's a looks like a fun guy or maybe you're just taking it easy or maybe you're riding a bike well your metabolic pathway is going to dick your, your metabolic state okay is going to dictate which pathways need to be active and which pathways need to be shut down and if you have opposing pathways they cannot both be running having intermediate intermediates fluxing through them at the same time so we'll talk about how do we control glycolysis versus gluconeogenesis also we will also talk about uh, glycogen synthesis versus glycogen degradation those are that's another example of opposing pathways that must must be regulated. Well, then we're going to get into hormonal regulation, and a lot of this is going to depend upon our blood sugar level. And so there are certain hormones that are secreted during different times of, uh, or different during times of, uh, I guess if you have low blood sugar or high blood sugar. And I think you've probably have heard of these before in some context. Insulin is secreted in response to high blood glucose and I'm using BG for blood glucose here another hormone glucagon is secreted again these two are secreted by the, by, by the pancreas in response to low blood glucose and the other example is epinephrine or adrenaline And really, epinephrine is kind of considered the fight or flight hormone. Now, we're probably going to spend most time, more time on insulin and glucagon, but the, the good thing is, in that case, is that glucagon and epinephrine work in a, in a somewhat similar manner. They each have receptors in which they bind to put forth a, a cascade of events inside the cell. All right, so we're going to have hormonal regulation of the metabolic pathways. Another type is allosteric regulation. You are already familiar with allosteric molecules or allosterism. In this case, uh, in allosteric regulation of the metabolic pathways, you are going to have s typically small molecules that bind to enzymes away from the active site but they influence the active site and then the net result is you can increase or decrease enzyme activity so we're going to see a lot of allosteric regulation of the metabolic pathways as, as we move forward. Uh, the fourth type is gene regulation. And so what we know is we can increase or decrease uh, the expression i.e. protein synthesis
of metabolic enzymes. And wow, wow, the best example of this is insulin. So insulin is going to have its hand, if you will, in hormonal regulation of metabolism, and it's also going to have a very important role to play in, in gene regulation. So let's, let's kind of keep moving on this. Again, I'm giving this video is kind of about big picture stuff. So if we come back here and uh, go to page 37, again, we're talking about the availability or activity of enzymes. And it's kind of specifically, we are most interested in metabolic enzymes. So this looks like a complicated picture, and it is, but really the heart of the matter is here's an enzyme. Let's say this enzyme is involved in some way in the metabolic pathways. Well, if we want to regulate this enzyme, we can do a variety of things. But all of these things that are in this image can fall into two broad categories. The first, number one, number two, and again, I'm just looking at the numbers on this, uh, on this image. One, two, three, four, five, and six all have to do with the availability of the enzyme. How much enzyme is around? If you want to mute a particular metabolic process and there are enzymes involved in that, if you just don't make as many enzymes that's involved in this metabolic pathway, then that's a way to control it. And so you can look here, look, uh, number two is transcription of a specific gene. Number four is translation, okay? Uh, number five is degradation. All of these that I'm showing you here, one, two, three, four, five, and six, have to do with what's the enzyme concentration? How much enzyme is available? And this table here shows us a very important thing is that new proteins, or if you want to say enzymes, are made on the, I'm going to say the day time scale. So it's not like, oh, all the enzymes in glycolysis, they're, they're available in the cell, and then they don't turn over for a week or a month or a year. Well, that wouldn't work in terms of regulating their availability. So we know that these new enzymes, <coughs> new enzymes or protein are typically kind of made and resynthesized on the day time scale. That allows the availability of these enzymes or proteins to be modulated in some type of regulatory scheme. Okay, so we can, we can regulate the availability of a metabolic enzyme. The other thing we can do, and we're going to spend most of our time on this, is we can regulate the activity of a metabolic enzyme. So, exactly, we can do allo, we can do allo, well, here we go. As we talked about on the last page, two of the more common ones are allosteric regulation and hormonal. Allosteric regulation can either turn on or turn off very specific metabolic enzymes. The, the action of hormones, usually by a complicated series of events that we will get into and you will be asked about, okay, can speed up or slow down very specific metabolic enzymes. Again, I'm making this video because I'm giving you the big picture on this. We're going to drill down into specifics as we move on. Well, Here's probably the, one of the most important tables in terms of availability. And again, here's our friend insulin. Okay, Insulin can do a variety of things. We're going to talk about it after Thanksgiving really in terms of its, its ability 
to control phosphatase enzymes, which can lead to the uh, dephosphorylation of metabolic enzymes, which can turn them on or turn them off. So insulin is going to play a huge role in hormonal regulation of metabolism. Well, guess what? It also plays a very important role in gene regulation. So look at table 15-5. And a few things I want to point out. Number one is that we have a lot of enzymes. And we're going to talk about some of these enzymes specifically. Some we don't. Okay, We will not talk about. But you need to know that there's two kind of two areas here. This is increased expression. That is, insulin leads to an increased concentration of these metabolic enzymes. Okay? Until you get down to decreased expression. So insulin can decrease the concentration of these important metabolic enzymes. And we're going to refer to this table over and over again because we're going to have to establish uh, I guess a coordination uh, between hormonal regulation and gene regulation. So if when we get back from Thanksgiving I say oh insulin is going to facilitate glycolysis. Well insulin better also increase the concentration of enzymes involved in glycolysis because that would work together. That would be complementary. That would be synergistic. Okay. So the question you may have is what do I need to know from this table? And I'm sorry but this Insulin is going to be a major focus of ours, except for these two examples, which I'm going to take off the table right now. You don't have to know these two. Now, I'm going to tell you, we're, I'm just going to, in a very cursory way, talk about these, because fatty acid synthesis is really biochemistry number two. But I'm going to want you to at least have some sense in biochemistry one how insulin can control glycolysis and how insulin can control the biosynthesis of fats and the breakdown of fats. So you, I've marked these off. These are really more biochem two But I want you to know all of these that I haven't marked off, okay? Um, because this is going to be very important. So know all these, which enzymes, which ones are increased, and what pathway they're in. You've just got to know this because we're going to come back to it over and over again. We're not going to. I'm not going to ask you too very specifically about the ones that I've kind of marked out in gray because they're more biochem too, but this gives you a more complete sense of how insulin can do its job. All right. Well, let's talk about reciprocal regulation of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis, okay? So what we see here is if you start with glucose and uh, you come down to fructose 6-phosphate, then we are really moving toward glycolysis moving down this way and then we are really moving in the direction of gluconeogenesis if you're moving up back up toward glucose and there are two enzymes that that are important here phosphofructokinase and we're going to call this PFK1 <clears throat> and this is going to be FBP ACE 1 and since I'm putting a 1 there just look out there's going to be a 2 later on okay so PFK1 is really what we're going to learn is the committed step of glycolysis it is the most important control point of glycolysis and in fact gluconeogenesis can't run can't run back toward glucose through PFK1 because PFK1 is essentially an irreversible reaction okay now let me go ahead and fill in some some stuff here if we keep going down this way we're gonna get pyruvate that's just glycolysis right but we have to kind of figure out what goes on afterwards pyruvate can make acetyl CoA and then acetyl-CoA condenses with a molecule called 
oxaloacetate to make citrate and then citrate's going to eventually in the in the citric acid cycle through several steps make back oxaloacetate ladies and gentlemen this is Krebs or the citric acid cycle so th this is the big picture okay but how do we reciprocally regulate glycolysis and gluconeogenesis if you're running one you need to shut down the other how do you do that you do that by controlling steps in each pathway that's common but they use two different enzymes right so in glycolysis we go to F6P just get used to the abbreviation it's what it is what it is fructose 6-phosphate goes to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. That's glycolysis route. But F1,6-BP goes back to F6B via fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. Okay? So, the point is, let's say you have a high blood glucose. Well, then you probably want to be converting that glucose and shove it, converting that glucose down to pyruvate through glycolysis. How can you increase flux through PFK1, or how do you increase flux through FBPase1? Well, some of these are under what we call reciprocal regulation, and so let me go over two of these. The first one, let's forget about blood glucose for the moment. Let's just forget about blood glucose. Let's just talk about citrate now. So it looks like citrate is an allosteric regulator of PFK, and it's a negative, negative, negative allosteric regulator of PFK1. But look over here. Citrate is a positive allosteric regulator of FBPase1. So what that says is citrate is more likely to slow down glycolysis, and it's more likely to speed up gluconeogenesis. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an example of reciprocal regulation by an allosteric modulator. Okay. Now, in all this regulation, what I want you to be able to do is think about what is the metabolic logic? What is the metabolic logic? Well, let's look over here. here here's citrate. Right here. So here, here's the logic behind citrate regulation of glycolysis and gluconeogenesis. If you have a lot of citrate available, now typically these allosteric modulators, it's understood they're present in somewhat high concentrations, okay? So if you have a, a high concentration of citrate, do you need to be running glycolysis to make pyruvate? and then pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, which can ultimately make more citrate. Well, no, I don't believe you do. So if citrate is abundant, that's a sign that citric acid cycle intermediates are abundant. How do you make more citric acid cycle intermediates? You run glycolysis, and then you run, and I didn't call it this a while ago, this is the bridge reaction. that makes more acetyl-CoA, which can ultimately help make more citrate. So from a metabolic logic perspective, this makes sense. You got citrate, you don't need to run glycolysis to make more, so let's, let's slow down glycolysis. Now, it's not the only input, right? So I'm not saying citrate can by itself completely shut down glycolysis, but it's a signal that says, hey, slow down a little bit. There's plenty of citrate available. Let's don't be running glycolysis just to make citrate because citrate is plentiful. And on the other hand, okay, citrate will kind of basically slow down PFK1, but it will turn on FBPase1. If, we're, if there's plenty of citrate around, maybe we should be going back the other way making glucose to store as glycogen. Maybe that's what we need to be doing. So you see there is a reciprocal regulation and the example that I'm using here is citrate. Now let's do another one. Let's do another one of these. AMP. 
AMP positively, allosterically regulates PFK1. AMP turns off FBPase1. Again, that's what we're talking about, reciprocal regulation. To understand that, let's go over here to the right and look at an equation called the energy charge of the cell. And you don't have to memorize that equation, but uh, there are some things about this, the energy charge you need to know. It really, the energy charge, energy charge gives us the energy status of the cell. And it can range from zero, which is all AMP, to one, which is all ATP. So, here we go. The energy charge of the cell is going to dictate which metabolic pathway may need to be run. Okay? If you have a lot of AMP, that really means that you have very little ATP. That's what the energy charge calculation is telling you. Okay? So, if you have very little AMP, we better make some ATP. How do you make ATP? You make ATP by, by running glycolysis, the bridge, the citric acid cycle, which feeds the electron transport system. Okay? So, this takes us to this statement. Catabolic pathways are what goes in the box. Hmm. Well, Catabolic pathways are blank by high energy charge. Oh, uh -huh. well, a high energy charge means we have a high ATP concentration. Ladies and gentlemen, if we have a high ATP concentration, do we need to run glycolysis? If we have a high ATP concentration, do we need to run glycolysis, which can ultimately feed the bridge, the citric acid cycle, electron transport system, and make more ATP. No. So, catabolic pathways, which are breakdown pathways like glycolysis, okay, gluconeogenesis is, by the way, an anabolic pathway. We're making glucose, okay. So, catabolic pathways are inhibited by high energy charge. And the converse would be as true as, as well. Catabolic pathways are facilitated by low energy charge. So again, the whole point of this is to understand reciprocal regulation. Also, a lot of times I'm going to ask you, why does this allosteric regulator or modulator act the way it does? Then it's all going to come back to, what is the metabolic logic? of this. What we see here is that if citrate concentration, this, let's just review this page, it's important. If citrate concentration is high, let's slow down glycolysis and let's speed up gluconeogenesis. Okay? Again, they're reciprocally regulated. If we have a high energy charge, that is uh, a high concentration of ATP, that means the AMP concentration is low, so we're probably going to high ATP, high ATP, high energy charge, we need to slow down glycolysis, speed up gluconeogenesis, reciprocally regulated. On the other hand, if we have low ATP, if we have low ATP, what needs to happen? If the, constant, if the energy charge of the cell is low, if I just told you, oh, the energy charge of the cell is low, we need to run gluconeogenesis. No, 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 because look at your handout. Gluconeogenesis is an endergonic pathway. If the energy charge is low, you do not want to be running an endergonic pathway. You need to run a pathway like glycolysis, which supports more synthesis in the long run of ATP. I just want to introduce you to the hormones before we get started after Thanksgiving. You may be familiar with these. 
Uh, insulin, wow. Very, very important in terms of its secretion when we have times of high blood glucose. We know that insulin resistance or the inability to make insulin is the contributor to diabetes mellitus in this country. A serious, serious, serious issue. And so we have to understand what is insulin and how does it regulate the metabolic pathways. Okay? So insulin actually is uh, it's a peptide hormone. Okay, or you may even call it a protein hormone. It's right near the, the, the borderline of protein and peptide. It's 51 amino acids in a dimer. Okay, and in fact, I should have probably written this over here because then if you look over here to the right, here's one of the dimers. In fact, all three of these are dimers, and this is what we call a trimer. Of dimers. Okay, dimer, dimer, dimer. So it's a trimer of dimers, which really makes insulin a hexamer. And in fact, sometimes we even see at the middle here to stabilize the hexameric form a zinc ion. Okay? And of course, the whole story of insulin is very long and complex, and I don't want to get into that, but this is just a, uh, like a vial of a particular type of what we call recombinant insulin because we can use recombinant sources either through other organisms like pigs or E. coli to make human insulin and Lantus is one you may have heard about or seen on uh, TV. So insulin is secreted uh, in response to high blood glucose. We're going to get down in the details if you want to say get down in the weeds of insulin and how it works. Another important hormone is glucagon glucagon is secreted by the pancreas during times of low blood glucose and it is also a peptide hormone and I've given you the amino acid sequence please don't memorize that uh, I just want you to know that it's a peptide hormone again low blood glucose we get secretion of glucagon and that's going to initiate a very complex set of events that's going to affect glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, glycogen synthesis, and glycogen breakdown. And hopefully I can make a case to you that all of this stuff follows a metabolic logic. Well the last hormone that we'll talk about is epinephrine or you may have heard it called adrenaline. It is the fight or flight hormone and it is actually a small organic molecule and at pH 7 this is going to be in the acid form and we're going to have a positive charge there and again it has one chiral center and the bioactive form is R so and as I said before glucagon and epinephrine work on in a similar manner in terms of initiating events within the cell to control metabolism insulin tends to work in an opposite fashion to glucagon and epinephrine. All right, so this is page 36 through 40. I think we're at a point now to where we can kind of finish up the rest of metabolism in our last three classes in kind of a, uh, a uh, I guess, more of a relaxed type fashion. All right, thanks.